In this video, we'll talk about statistical significance and p-values. Hypothesis testing usually requires us to construct a test statistic, which could be something simple, like the proportion of data satisfying a certain condition, or something slightly more complicated, like a t-score or a z-score, which we'll talk more about later. That test statistic has a range of possible values, and we have some idea about the statistical distribution of those values. Often, due to the central limit theorem, the distribution will be Gaussian or derived from a Gaussian, and there's a large and old literature about deriving distributions appropriate for different situations. When we have a test statistic, we compute the p-value, which is the probability that a test statistic as extreme as the one that was observed would occur if the null were true. In the figure, this is the blue area. It's the probability of seeing a deviation as large or larger than the one observed in the experiment. If this is confusing, remember that usually small p-values are good. They indicate that something very unusual has happened, which would likely not have occurred if the null were true. Therefore, the null hypothesis is likely false. It's common practice to fix the significance level, often denoted by the letter alpha. If we choose alpha equals 0.01, we're saying that our observed test statistic should only occur by chance 1 in 100 times. This is represented by a simple threshold on the values of our test statistic. If the experimental result is to the left of the threshold, we fail to rule out the null, and if it's to the right, then we do rule out the null. Different fields have different preferred significance levels. Particle physicists like values of alpha, which give a 1 in 1 million likelihood of the result arising by chance. In medicine and social sciences, an alpha of 0.05, or 1 in 20 chance, is often sufficient to rule out the null. Typically, a small p-value implies strong evidence against the null hypothesis. This means, assuming the null is true, that you measured an improbable value, so the null hypothesis can be rejected. A large p-value indicates weak evidence against the null, so you fail to reject the null hypothesis. This doesn't mean the null is true, just that we haven't seen any evidence to indicate otherwise. Marginal p-values, say values which are very close to the significance threshold, something like 0.049 or 0.051, are generally inconclusive. If possible, collecting more data can help determine which side of the line we're on, but at this stage we run into some of the issues that plague formal hypothesis testing. Is 0.049 publishable and 0.051 is useless? Would we really want to make vastly different decisions based on small differences in p-value, for example manufacturing a drug or abandoning it? To give a simple example of hypothesis testing in action, let's say we flip a coin a number of times. The null hypothesis is that the coin is fair, so it lands heads or tails with equal probability. The test statistic x is the number of heads. Five flips give five heads, so x equals five. The probability of this under the null is one half to the power of five, which is roughly 0.03. In this case, the p-value is therefore 0.03. Since we know that biased coins are rare, we should have quite a high threshold for rejecting the hypothesis that the coin is fair. That is, our alpha will be small. So 0.03 is low, but likely not low enough. And in conclusion, we can basically find that there is some hint that the coin is biased, but we need to do more experiments to determine if we have a really biased coin. Finally note that there are two different types of hypothesis test, one-tailed and two-tailed. Our examples in this video so far have implicitly assumed a one-tailed effect, but the diagram above shows a two-tailed effect. To perform a two-tailed test with a significance level of 0.05, you allot half of your alpha to testing the statistical significance in one direction, and the other half to testing statistical significance in the other direction. This means that 0.25 is in each tail of the distribution. And if you see a value that is extremely low or extremely high, you rule out the null. For a two-tailed test, the null hypothesis could be something like the test statistic has mean zero. So for example, think of a test statistic which is the difference in two measurements. If the difference is normally distributed with mean zero, this implies that the two measurements are basically the same. In this case, the alternative hypothesis for a two-tailed test is that the test statistic is not zero. That is, if we observe a very large difference, that would be implausible under normal distribution, and we'd be able to say that the two measurements were different. For a one-tailed test, the null hypothesis is different. It's now a statement that the test statistic is less than or equal to zero. That is, we don't care about large deviations to the left. The alternative is a logical opposite. In this case, it would be that the test statistic is greater than zero. We could use a one-tailed test for something like choosing between new long-lasting light bulbs or use, continuing to use whatever bulbs we currently have. We only care if the new bulbs last longer than the old ones. If they're the same or worse, we'll just keep using the current bulbs. We only care about the differences in one direction. Note that a more extreme upward deviation is required to flag a significant under a two-tailed than a one-tailed test. So for marginal cases, choosing a one-tailed or two-tailed test may be quite relevant as to whether you have a significant result or not.